record distribution today. So we'll dive right in and get started talking about exclusives. So what are exclusives? Um, so from time to time, a single store chain like Walmart or Target will make a deal with an artist or label to be the exclusive distributor of a CD. Another method of ensuring promotion at a particular chain is to give them exclusive distribution for a certain period of time before an album goes into general circulation. So this is a either a certain set amount of time that you can only buy this uh, song or album at a fiscal location um, or you know some some um, some artists choose to do a lifelong deal with that uh, store chain for that song or that album and that's kind of rare for that to happen but um, it has happened from time to time these days exclusives have made their way into the digital realm so what we just talked about was cds a uh, physical copy of it uh, now we're talking about platforms that's how you become exclusive so um, platforms such as apple tidal you can say spotify uh, throw any streaming or download um, application on there you know insert it there um, they have developed exclusive content deals with such artists as Drake, Beyonce. Uh, when an artist is red hot, this limited availability of a new release draws huge numbers of subscribers to these platforms. I know Tidal's big thing for a while was they had Prince's music. You know, when so when Prince is, when Prince died, the only place you could listen to his music was Tidal, um, and their subscribers went up like crazy uh, during that period. Now you can listen to it anywhere, but. Um, you know, the, the big takeaway from this is, you know, um, the streaming platforms also have exclusives. So, what's the problem with exclusives? The problem with exclusives is that they, ir they irritate any group of stores or competing digital platforms who are unable to get a new and highly sought after album. Okay. Just stay there for a second. So why is that a problem? Why is irritating a group of stores or competing digital platform? Who cares, right? Who cares if those things are irritating? Well, you know, me from a consumer point of view, I'm thinking... You know, I was a kid once. I, you know, oh, well, even today, I'm not subscribed to Apple Music and Tidal and Spotify, you know. Um, I have one of them. I have Spotify. That's it. You know, I'm not paying that $10 three times just to get all the, you know, all the exclusives here and there. To me, it doesn't make much financial sense to do that because I'm not listening to much of the exclusive content on any of those platforms most stuff i listen to is available across the platforms so um but if i was younger um teenager or you know middle schooler and my parents bought me a subscription to apple music and i loved you know I loved uh, Beyonce, for instance, or Adele, or whoever, and they weren't available on that. You know, that's you're starting to isolate some of your your fans. You're starting to ostracize them a little bit uh, because they can't necessarily get that, or you know, it it's might be hard to uh, switch over for them. You know, so that that can be the problem with exclusives. Okay, let's talk about wholesale and retail prices. Now, you just warn you guys, um, a lot of this stuff, 
the record industry is mainly done in the digital realm these days, right? But the physical realm does still exist, so we still have to know how um, how to interact with it if we get the opportunity, if when we get the opportunity, and uh, what the standards are with physical copies. So, that being said, wholesale and retail prices. So, we're talking about physical copies, the price the, the retail store pays a distributor. Generally, it's between 35 and 50% of suggested retail price. Okay? So, if a album, you go to Walmart, for instance. You go over and you want to buy a CD. Or you want to buy a vinyl. Okay? Let's take that for an example. Um, say the vinyl is uh, $30. Okay? The high end of what they're paying for that is $15. Okay? Off that 30 the low end would be around around 19 and a half bucks that'd be about 35%. So anywhere from or I'm sorry. Um, nine and a half bucks would be about 35%. Um, so they're paying the store is paying anywhere from nine and a half to fifteen dollars, and the store is going to sell that for thirty dollars. Now, what happens to that? You know, let's just for 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 easy uh, math, okay? Let's just say the store pays ten dollars for a thirty dollar album. Okay, what what's happening with that ten dollars? I mean, it's going to get distributed among. That's what we'll talk about in future lectures. Okay. Um, so often chains in retail in retail stores sell CDs at a 10 to 20% discount off the SLRP. So stores may also run lost leader specials. For example, a hot album, like an Adele album, may be sold at a special discount. The intent is to bring customers in who will buy additional albums or other store merchandise if the store is a Best Buy or a Target, for example. So if, you know, Adele's 21 album was available at Target back in whenever she released it, uh, they, you know, it, it may, the retail price on that CD might have been $20, for example. But they may have ran a special on it, $10, with the belief that people would come in the store, buy the album, and then buy more albums or buy other goods from the store. Okay, let's talk about cutouts. Cutouts are out-of-print albums that are resold at very low prices. A few companies specialize in cutouts. When, a, when an album is cut out, no royalties are paid to the artists, music publishers, or songwriters. Okay? So these aren't used albums. These are out-of-print albums. They're usually sold from the uh, manufacturers or from stores, wherever they, these companies can get them. So, this is a specialized, or this is specified in record company contracts with artists. Selling cutouts and used albums requires a savvy store owner who understands when such items will sell and when the consumer remains uninterested in an album, no matter how low the price may be. Okay, let's talk about artist sales now. 
many artists sell their own albums at performances. If the artist sells... Um, the artist sells their own album. Um, the profit margin far exceeds what the artist would have received in royalties from a label. It is normal for artists to sell CDs for 15 bucks at shows, for instance. Okay. So the royalties you get from that are, are going to be a lot better than what you get from the label after they sold it to a store. Many of the smaller record companies rely on sales by artists. That's how they pay for the production of the albums. So typically here, they sell albums to artists at a greatly reduced price, five to seven bucks, and then they give the artists a good profit from album sales. So, essentially, these small record companies will will uh, sell the album to the artist, five seven bucks, and then if that artist that artist can choose to give it away for free, they'll lose money. They can choose to sell it for five to seven dollars and break even, um, and or they can sell it for fifteen bucks and make a, a good margin on it. It's it's up to them really. Okay, digital distribution. Let's talk about it. Because digital files can be, and often are, shared illegally, record companies initially ignored digital distribution as a profit-making platform. But during the 90s, Subscription-based services such as Rhapsody developed. So, why, why did record companies, why were they disinterested in digital distribution? Because they thought they weren't going to make money. Okay. A company called Napster kind of destroyed the music industry um, this was late 90s they completely destroyed music industry uh, to the point where you had Metallica and Lars Ulrich or however you say his name um, and I'm up there saying you know crying saying how wrong it was for you know these people to get his albums for free, you know, they're, they're e illegally getting it, they're stealing the music. And while that may be true to a certain extent, uh, they came off looking like crybabies because they're millionaires and broke kids were getting their albums because they wanted them, you know. People who came out smelling a lot better uh, were artists like... Uh, Foo Fighters, for instance, said, I don't care how you get them, just, just get the album. You know, if you can buy it, cool, that's great. If not, that's great too, just listen to it. Radiohead even put their album up for sale in the 2000s um, just for whatever people were willing to pay for it. So you had an option. You could pay nothing for it and get it for free. Or you can pay 10 bucks for it or whatever. They said, you know, whatever you feel like, just pay us that. All right, so streaming services. Um, we're talking about the early streaming services like Rhapsody. Uh, these services allow listeners to freely listen to and download music as long as they paid a subscription fee. Although these services did not prove as successful as record companies hoped they would be, Apple's iTunes negotiated deals with major labels that allowed the legal downloading of music. Okay, So early record companies were actually somewhat streaming services. Or, you know, the early digital distribution, like Rhapsody, but that kind of went away uh, 
and fell to iTunes. iTunes was a major thing for a long time. When Apple's iPod was introduced in 1991, many customers loaded hundreds of tunes onto these devices. Although initially there was a uniform charge of 99 cents for each song, eventually this uniform pricing was abandoned. These days, the iTunes platform is rapidly being surpassed through streaming on demand to computers and cell phones. In future lectures, we'll discuss streaming, royalties for streaming, and various digital services that make streaming possible. So, I just want to talk about iTunes for a minute. The cool thing about your iTunes library back in the day, before Apple Music, where you could stream, was it, Apple didn't really care where you got the music. You could get it from the Apple Store. You could download it to your computer on CDs and still put it in your iTunes library. They didn't care. You know, I'm not, I'm not saying I ever did this, of course, but you could pirate the music. Places like... LimeWire was a big one. Or the Pirate Bay. Anybody remember that? You know, these are illegal places that nobody should have ever gone. And I'm sure nobody did. But iTunes didn't care where you, where you got this from. You could make... You could make CDs with your playlist on them. And you might even be able to give that CD out to a, uh, you know, romantic interest of yours. We've lost that today. Just sending a playlist that you made in Spotify doesn't really, doesn't really have the same gravitas to it, does it? Oh, well. Well, that's streaming. Guys and gals. So... We talked about record distribution. Uh, next lecture, we're going to talk about record promotion and the different ways to do that. So uh, we'll see you next time. <laughs>